Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Trade Australia. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophels. Trade Australia is brought to you by Australian Trade Logistics Corporation and our national partners, as well as the Ethical Trade Alliance. Today's episode is so important. It's all about the global shipping crisis that so many importers and exporters, not just here in Australia, but all around the world, are grappling to deal with. What we've got for you today, we've got some industry experts, not just here in Australia, but from overseas as well. So we've got Anthony Vincent, who's the head of international freight and logistics at Freight Trade Alliance, FTA. We've got Zoran Kostanovsky, who's the head of border and biosecurity and the regional manager for Vic, Taz and uh, South Australia for IFCBA, the International Porters Customs Brokers Association of Australia. And to wrap it up, we've actually got the privilege to have on the show Peter Sand, who's a chief shipping analyst for BIMCO, the world's largest shipping association. So stick around. Coming up after this break, we're going to kick straight into our interviews and we'll have got a, a fantastic episode you just don't, don't want to miss. We'll see you soon. Welcome back. Kicking off our first range of expert interviews on today's Global Shipping Crisis episode of Trade Australia, I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony Vincent, or Tony Vincent for some of those who, who know, know him as Tony. So he's the Head of International Freight and Logistics at the Freight Trade Alliance, or FTA, here in Australia. They've played an important part of really showing what the government and keeping the industry up to date around what's going on. Thanks so much for joining me, Tony. So, Tony, uh, just wanted to introduce you Tony Vincent, you're the Head of International Freight Logistics at FTA. Uh, please help myself and all the viewers of the Trade Australia show paint the picture about the current situation and a brief overview of the current market dynamics, please. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for the invitation and happy to be here. Look, in a, in a very brief overview, look, the market dynamics, we have imports and export volumes in, in, into and out of Australia are remaining very, very strong. Um, current demand forecasting requires that um, uh, importers and exporters look at their trade lane sectors and bookings uh, well in advance around the four to six week um, mark. And that's a really um, necessity in the, in the current market dynamics. Uh, carrier capacity constraints in relation to vessel cargo space and equipment remains tight. Uh, carriers are continuing to adjust their vessel schedules because of the significant ongoing delays caused by the poor congestions weather, uh, increases in uh, COVID-19 outbreaks. We're seeing a uh, shortage of uh, equipment, sorry, shortage of empty containers persists in Asia Pacific. Uh, the situation is not expected to improve in the immediate future. But 20, 20 and 44 containers in short supply in China, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia and Indonesia. So hence the carriers continue priority is to return empty containers to Asia, ex Australia. Now, although the scale of the COVID-19 outbreaks is relatively small, uh, various governments around the world have a zero tolerance policy and that markedly curtails economic activities. Um, an example of this is, is Vietnam. It's suffering in the southern cities where there's lots of factories and warehouses are located. Uh, COVID-19 cases are increasing uh, trend. Lockdowns are, are likely to continue. So that has a direct impact on vessel schedules. Uh, vessel delays in, in those ports there uh, of one to three days are likely to see a, a 10 week, 12 port rotation uh, extended out to 11 to 12 weeks. Uh, carriers are reporting various congestion issues in ports like Singapore. Um, those delays can be up to around six days. Singapore port authorities are continuing to navigate through terminal yard density and slower than normal productivity due to extended terminal processes. The European ports continue to be a challenge in berthing and waiting times, labour shortages and higher terminal density. Uh, West Coast America at the moment, is, there are considerable delays and port congestion. The latest reports indicate that there's over 70 container vessels awaiting to berth in Long Beach uh, port terminal. Uh, various reasons for that, you know, high yard, uh, con con congestion density, a longer port dwell times, uh, labour shortage. Um, we're seeing in America a 30% increase in volume and that's likely to continue to the end of the year. 
So all these global disruptors and dynamics have a, has a downstream effect on vessel arrivals and schedules into Australia. Um, we've seen carriers implement various what we call GRIs or general rate increases, uh, peak season surcharges and other surcharges in, in the last quarter, quarter three. Uh, I guess the good news story is that the federal government has recently announced the extension of the um, export air freight program IFAM in Australia until the end of 31st of July, 2022. Um, so that's really good news for the Australian agricultural exporter and that'll ensure produce like seafood lamb, beef, pork and dairy can be shipped cost effectively to overseas markets, but particularly in Asia. Mm -hmm. That's just a general update. Um, I could probably go on a lot longer, but there's a yeah. brief overview for you. Well, thanks, Tony. Look, it's it's a really, um, you know, I know it's such a big scope and thanks for trying to sort of keep that into a, 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 a small sort of tidbit of some of the, the, the highlights, if you like, around those global impacts and, and reasons. It's so so much moving parts as we talked on talked about before uh, the episode, and I wanted to ask you as well, Tony, what are the impact on all those things for for regional exporters? Look, it's, it's an interesting question that you ask. Um, look, we re recently completed, completed a case study relating to grain exporters, which have been hugely impacted by obviously the increasing sea freight rates and charges. Um, bushfires and droughts that they've suffered over in, in the recent years. Um, this year's seen a, a really good grain numbers for export and good returns for the Australian farmers despite the increase in costs. And this has been around mainly due to the Northern Hemisphere uh, countries like Russia and the USA not being able to meet uh, custom requirements in various markets around the world. So it's been a good opportunity for the Australian grain producer to fulfil those gaps and meet those actual contracts. But it's something we need to be quite mindful of that whilst the production here is, is very good here in Australia, if the balance returns back in the favour of the Northern Hemisphere, the Australian grain grower could find themselves with either considerable lower return terms or just basically uncompetitive in the global market. Yeah, it's definitely more challenges. As you say, they've already had a, a whole challenging period over the last few years and now they've got to deal with some more yeah. some more impacts as well. So you know, wishing them all the best to, to continue to grow their export opportunities. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, Tony, about the FTA. You guys joined the industry colleagues in a, in a round table. I think it was a virtual round table meeting with um, Dan Tien, the Minister for Trade. And yes. You know, tourism investment to discuss key issues, all the challenges relating to all these international shipping and logistics. What were the outcomes and what did you guys discuss with the Minister, please? Oh, look, very briefly, as I said, it was an opportunity for um, various industry bodies and ex import and export organisations to very briefly um, have the opportunity to put to Dan Teen, um, in a very short presentation of, of what they see as the current issues around international shipping and logistics, and to try and come up with some um, solutions for the, sh for the short to medium term. Now, from an FTA perspective, um, some of those solutions we suggested to the federal government um, maybe look at some sort of uh, industry review. And we're not suggesting that there be a regulation on price. Um, we, we need foreign owned shipping lines to continue servicing Australia to avoid the risk of um, redeployment to other more lucrative markets. Equally, we appreciate the need for ongoing vessel sharing arrangements as larger vessels are deployed to provide economics of scale and um, potential cost of efficiency. But um, we do see there's a need for a review of the 2015 Australian Competition Policy Review. Uh, that's part 10 of the, of the competition policy. Um, we view that's outdated and unnecessary. Um, it's it, there's there's things that need to be to be done in that space to, um, in very simple terms, view of the shipping lines should compete in line with the normal um, competition law faced by other Australian companies. But then, if it's the government's, well, sorry, if the government determines a need for special ongoing protections for to the shipping lines. Um, we'd recommend that it be overseen by a federal regulator who would have the mandate to ensure minimum shipping services and, and providing you know, adequate, ex ex sorry, ad adequate access to export markets for um, Australian exporters. Mm. 
Yeah, that's um, it's it's great that you've had the opportunity to speak with the minister and put forward all these uh, challenges and and give some recommendations and some ideas because I think it um, probably doesn't have happen often enough, especially now with coming out of mm. COVID. All the companies around Australia are trying to get back on their feet to rebuild from a trade perspective. You know, you, you painted the picture so well, Tony, about all the challenges that the globe's facing across these supply chain disruptions. So I think Australia needs to really do whatever we can to help uh, Australian companies compete on a global level. The IFAM is a great uh, example of that, but I think the, mm. the dialogue that you guys have with FTA and, and you know, the, the governments and the industry itself is really important to make sure that um, you know, you're the voice of those, those shippers really to try and help those companies to, to get the message across and, and make some positive change. So it's really important the work that FTA does. I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, you know, and look forward to keeping in touch with on a regular basis as this all evolves over the next you know, months and years to come, I'm sure. Okay, excellent. Happy to, to contribute to your, your program. Thanks so much, Tony. Great to have you on the show and um, really appreciate your time. As I said, look forward to chatting again very soon. Take care. Excellent. Take care. So there you've heard from Tony Vinson from FTA. They've got, they're doing some great work making sure that they're championing all the industry to the government and making sure that they're, they're the voice to really help navigate this certain situation and crisis in the best way possible. So stick around after this break. We're going to have some quick industry updates and we'll be back joined by Zoran Kostanovsky from IFCBA. See you soon. Now is the time to reduce costs and get better service from your logistics partners. We go to market for you. We do all the work. You make all the decisions. First, we review your requirements, customised to your business. Then, we design your tender documents, RFQ and submission templates. Next, we put it out to market, to suitable service providers only. We analyse and score the submissions using a weighted scorecard. We shortlist the best candidates, specifically matched to your needs. We invite presentations from the candidates. They compete for your business. You select and enjoy the benefits, including KPIs and SLAs. We offer fixed price programs starting from as little as $5,000. When did you last compare your service providers? Contact us today at the Australian Trade and Logistics Corporation. Think about the clothes you're wearing, the food you're eating, or even the furniture in your home. There is a story and history associated with every product you've ever bought. Unfortunately, sometimes the workers who make your products are subjected to terrible working conditions, are not treated fairly, or the manufacturing process is harmful to the environment. There are many forms of modern slavery and damaging production methods, but it's up to us, industry leaders and the consumers themselves to take a stand so that we can contribute to a healthier planet and to changing the lives of everyone involved across the global supply chains for the better. Ethical Trade Alliance enables buyers to make informed choices on all of the products they purchase. Welcome back everyone. Now joining me via Zoom is Zoran Kostanarovsky. He's the head of biosecurity and border for IFCBA, the International Forwarders and Customs Brokers Association of Australia. He's a, a long time friend of the show and they do such an important role representing forwarders and brokers here in Australia. Thanks for joining me again, Zoran. Always good to have you on the show. How are you? I'm good and thanks for the opportunity, Lawrence. Always a pleasure to be with you. Great. Thanks, Zoran. Look, there's so many um, challenges. This whole episode is talking about um, shedding light on, on the, the supply chain disruptions, the shipping crisis. You know, what are the key issues that, that you think uh, 
are caused by the shipping crisis and what's your sort of take on everything right now? Uh, certainly, Lawrence. Uh, the global pandemic has changed international trade. And some, some of the reasons for that is that the, uh, the demand is greater than the supply. As, as uh, Australia being an island relies heavily on trade and most of us in the major cities are locked up we have, and live in bigger homes, what we have done is we've gone into the online buying, we've gone and uh, repairing some of our home maintenance and other, so the white goods, uh, a lot of those things are in very high demand. People working from home, buying more computers, laptop screen, home offices, renovation. So what that has created is a greater uh, consumption. So the demand for, for trade for goods is much, much higher in Australia uh, than the supply. So it's created that um, capacity issues uh, just from a general economics, you know, all of a sudden the, we're finding that there is a shortage of space. Uh, there are also port congestions are creating this issue. Uh, you've got COVID cases in certain ports where the ports have been closed down for, um, for a longer period. Uh, all of these are adding uh, pressure to the supply chain. And the way we see it, that the world economy runs on global supply chain and our members' strength is to manage the supply chain end to end. And um, this is what this particular pandemic is causing. They're, they're the major issues. So we're finding um, our members are you know, trying to navigate to help the importers and exporters to facilitate trade. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Aaron. I think, you know, you mentioned that the you know, your members are, are really copping the brunt of it from the their customers' perspective, the importers and exporters, but themselves as forwarders and brokers, What's the impact been to them? I mean, they're, you know, they're obviously the meat between in the sandwich, so to speak, in many ways, aren't they? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And one of, one of the things we've got to remember, there are, there are big importers and there are small, medium-sized importers. Uh, what's happened through the, uh, the shortage of demand has pushed a lot of the prices. So what, what, what that does, it puts pressure on our members to then also try and secure space on vessels. So the... Uh, the shortage has created a bit of a issue for the smaller freight forwarders and the smaller importers. They're not able to negotiate the rates that they need. Some of the contracts are not binding. They're pushed to go to uh, spot rates. So it's a matter of uh, you know, pressure for people to try and get on those vessels. Uh, makes it very, very difficult uh, for the SMEs. Some of the bigger guys are also impacted because they are also not able to meet or fulfill those contract obligations. We hear about uh, shipping lines forcing forwarders and big importers to, um, to you know, cancel those agreements. So that the question becomes, is a contract a binding contract with the line? It appears not to be. It's a, it's a two-way street. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the future in relation to what is considered a, a shipping contract, you know, where they will be tested in the court of law. But that's, it creates some price issues, prices and everything for us. For us, is about supply chain efficiency, uh, our members are not able to facilitate a trade. There's lack of certainty. You don't know where the ship will turn, whether the ship will bypass a certain port, whether you can actually get space on that vessel and whether your container will be offloaded, uh, you know, because they can't meet that ship. So that, that's the pressure it creates to, to deliver to your customer when freight forwarders and brokerages rely themselves on service delivery, end-to-end -end management, and that's the reason why importers and exporters use our members to provide that service. So there's a lot of uncertainty. It's a bit harder to manage international trade. It's a bit harder to, to sell freight and it is a lot harder to deliver products to the customers when they need them. So that is the key challenge at the moment um, our members are facing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a, a tough sector to, to be in. And that, you know, that one word that, you mentioned that really stood out to me is that uncertainty. No one can really plan or you know manage something with. There's so many things that are uncertain, and it's definitely a moving target constantly. So, with that in mind, what are the type of things that you'd recommend for the importers and exporters to be aware of? How can they sort of build in some sort of tolerance or buffers around all this uncertainty? If the advice is to uh, the blame game doesn't work. The blame game, I've said it before, will not improve the, the global supply chain. You know, where the people that there's discussion about regulation of, uh, of, of shipping and all those things, we'll leave that for 
for the relevant bodies and, and governments to decide. But for us, it's about maximizing the use of the global supply chain. So there are bottlenecks in different parts of the chain, not just you know uh, shipping lines, ports, land side. So for us, is to, for us to be efficient, we need to make sure that the importers work with the freight forwarders, work with the shipping lines, also work with the suppliers offshore. Uh, look at the way you you order stock. Just in time is not no longer good enough, and also you might have to consider which freight has to actually travel because everyone is trying to bump up inventory for the Christmas period, it actually adds a lot more pressure to the supply chain. So the importers would have to look at the way they manage the supply chains, the way they control stock. Because you, you know, even filling up your warehouses is not going to help your global supply chain. So you might have to <laughs> prioritize what cargo has to come in. What is it really selling? Stuff that is not selling as much can probably come a lot later and maybe after the new year. So, Reviewing of the whole supply chain will be very critical because we always keep saying it, it is companies now more than ever will be competing on supply chain efficiency. Mm. It's not even the price. The price was low. Even then you were competing supply chain efficiency. But now in order to be able to get your product to the market, yeah. it is having a good supply chain. Work with the people, unite, collaborate, communicate, use the latest technology of tracking, those people that can help you, you've got to work with to be able to, to meet your uh, objective. And that is to get your product to the consumers because it is a consumer uh, market at the moment. The consumers want, the consumers are spending. And to be honest, I, I can't see this, um, the supply uh, increasing. Even if you increase, the demand is not slowing down. And it might take us to the new year or end of next year before people start to travel, spend more on holidays, uh, more on services rather than goods. So I, ca I can't see that until the international borders open up, until the aviation industry sector uh, fully operates where we're getting passenger and traveling, because we're having a lot of air cargo being uh, trans transferred to sea freight. Yeah. A lot more containers are coming and we can solve that cargo for, because it is there's no capacity on the, um, on the uh, aviation sector. And we're lucky that the IFAM pro uh, program and funding has been extended by the government to mid next year. Mm -hmm. It at least allows Australian producers and exporters to get their products to the market via air freight. So that is my advice to them. I think you've got to relook at the whole thing at the way you do business because doing business today is totally different. And maybe doing business in the next year might even look even more different. Yeah. Yeah, very true. I think there's a lot more to play out in all this supply chain, you know, dynamics over the coming months and years. And yeah, I don't think it's ever going to go back to the way it was, you know, pre-COVID. So there's going to be a lot of shifts and before things start to settle down. So thanks so much, Zoran. Always great to have you on the show. And you know, um, looking forward to hopefully catching up in person sometime before the end of the year, if possible. But um, always good to catch up, man. And, and thanks for all your 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 tips and advice to the importers and exporters and the work that you've come out does as well. Thanks, Lawrence. Always a pleasure to catch up with you, mate. And uh, I agree. Uh, can't wait to have a beer one day with you, mate. Yeah, look forward to it. Take care. Thanks, Zoran. So I've just heard from Zoran from Ifkabar. They've got some great work that they're doing to support forwarders, brokers, and trying to help importers and exporters understand how what they can do better uh, to manage this situation as well now and into the future. So um, stick around after this short industry update. We'll be joined from Denmark in Copenhagen by Peter Sand, the Chief Shipping Analyst from Bimco. Hi, it's Christian from NSYNC Personnel. This week's update sees us presenting to you an export manager role available in Southwest Sydney. This role would suit an experienced manager that is currently in the role with another organisation looking for a change. A thorough understanding of both export air freight and export sea freight is required. The role's responsibilities will include managing a team of three staff, high level interaction with senior staff and management, a focus on profit and loss at a job level, management of whips and accruals, and building strong relationships with service providers. Our client utilizes EDI CargoWise, so experience within this software package would be highly desirable, but not, re not required. There will be an op opportunity for flexible working arrangements once you are sufficient within the role, and the role will be paying up to 100K plus super. For more information, 
please contact me on 0439 542 022 or drop me a line at christian at insyncpersonnel.com.au. Thanks and have a great day. Cheers. Hi, I'm Adam Lane from Trade Plus 24, a Melbourne-based fintech that specialises in lines of credit for SMEs to assist with working capital. And this week, I'm giving you a finance update. In light of the issues around the shipping container crisis, I thought I'd take this segment back to basics and talk about what to do when there's disruptions to the supply chain and how we advise businesses that we have the pleasure of dealing with. For many of the more experienced amongst you, this may be a bit academic, but hopefully it's useful for some of you. I think the first comment I'd make is that cash flow forecasting is key. Understanding when you're getting paid and need to pay suppliers is really critical, especially in times of crisis. The other thing to note is dialogue is key. Talking to your suppliers, talking to your customers, and maybe talking to your bank around times of stress. Diversification is really important to ensure that you've not got all of your eggs in one basket, whether it be one customer or one supplier, because when shipping lines or shipping routes are disrupted, it can be really challenging for businesses. Negotiate payment terms where possible whether that be on the supplier or the customer side, because cash flow is king in running a business. Another option is cash flow lending, whether that be export finance or whether that be import finance. There are lots of options and I'd I'd recommend that any of you that are struggling at the moment really look at the different financing options that are available. We have the pleasure of talking to a number of export businesses because we're one of the few lenders in Australia that allows customers to leverage their international invoices to be able to provide working capital. And I was talking to a customer just last week that exports rail components into Southeast Asia and and Western Europe. And they've been really impacted by the shipping container crisis, but but have been able with effective cash flow forecasting to really weather the storm, no pun intended. So if you do have any opportunity that you'd like to talk to us about, please get in touch. But that's all for now. Thank you and goodbye. Welcome back, everyone. To wrap up today's important episode of Trade Australia, we've got the absolute pleasure of being joined all the way from De- Copenhagen in Denmark by one of the world's most respected uh, chief shipping analysts, Peter Sand from BIMCO. Now, BIMCO, for those of you who don't know, is the world's largest international shipping association, and they have got over 2,000 members in 120 countries, and they represent basically all areas of shipping across containers, tankers and uh, dry bulk liners. So uh, absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me, Peter. It's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Lawrence. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be able to uh, share some insights from uh, from BIMCO market analytics team. Uh, but, but BIMCO, as you may or may not know, is the world's largest shipping association. We help uh, close to 2,000 members across the globe in 130 countries. With, uh, with insights into the commercial shipping markets, with contracts and clauses to, to do business by and basically facilitate trade. And also for, for our members to better understand the regulatory challenges and issues on a, on a, on a global scale, as well as a, le- a regional scale, with BIMCO holding an observatory seat at the, at the UN International Maritime Organization, uh, the, the main legislative body for, for international maritime uh, tra- shipping. So, uh, so I'm very pleased to, to, uh, to, to share with you uh, some of those insights that, that we uh, see from, uh, from the commercial shipping markets uh, in, uh, in, in my team. Thanks so much, Peter. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and really looking forward to, to capturing that, that insight. I know that um, it's a great title, Chief Shipping Analyst. So uh, what's your personal background? I know, you know you've obviously been in the industry for quite some time. Have you been with, with BIMCO long? Uh, I've been with uh, BIMCO for more than 12 years now. And, uh, and well, my, my, my background is, uh, and I, I'm an economist by training uh, from, uh, from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, I'm just in love with, uh, with the world and the geography as, as, as such. So that combination with the uh, economy and, uh, and, and geography suits perfectly into to the role of, of, of understanding uh, the, uh, the world's largest invisible industry. Yeah. Uh, basically translating global macroeconomic developments into uh, to, uh, what that means to, uh, to shipping 
uh, and, uh, and, and freight rates uh, around the globe. Uh, why do we see Australia, for instance, being one of the, uh, the big uh, export uh, regions of, of the world, in particular for, for, for dry bulk commodities, uh, understanding where those uh, trade lanes are, are going to, I think is, a, is an integral part of uh, what I do every day. Fantastic. And, you know, I think you're the ideal person to ask some of the questions I've got in mind because with so much going on over the last 18 months or so, and it doesn't look like there's much, you know, hope in sight for some of these challenges, but I'm so delighted to be able to pick your brain with this. But what are some of the key drivers, Peter, you know, causing this global shipping crisis right now? And, you know, what are some of the regions that are most affected around the world? If I may, I will cut this into uh, to three pieces uh, because uh, we cover uh, container shipping, uh, dry bulk, and, and, and tankers. And the recovery of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic is, is very uneven uh, between the three uh, shipping sectors. And, and that, of course, originates from, from, from the base of it. What happened last year and also uh, in, in which way is the world uh, recovering right now in terms of, uh, of, of uh, not only economic activity, but, but surely also um, uh, still measures taken to uh, to prevent uh, the virus from from spreading is of course still putting a, a, a damper to to that of, of international aviation and, and transports in, in in general. But I guess what uh, what covers the most headlines uh, these days is the container shipping market, uh, which is uh, which is boosted. Uh, to say the least, uh, by the fiscal stimulus uh, provided to American consumers that have completely turned uh, the, the, the markets uh, on, its, uh, uh, well, on its head from, uh, from uh, cancelling sailings uh, left, right and centre uh, in the early parts of 2020 to, uh, to every single container ship and ships from, from many other sectors transporting boxes predominantly into North America. It's super crazy, to be honest. Uh, imports into North America is up by 33% mm -hmm. on the pre-pandemic level. Uh, for comparison, uh, the pre-pandemic uh, volume growth into to, to Europe from Far East is flat. So, uh, so still we see um, impacts from uh, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, all but breakdown of, uh, of the supply chains. Uh, having ripple effects on a global scale uh, with uh, with freight rates uh, above ten thousand dollars per per, per wow. foot unit, basically into uh, into to, to Europe and, and North America, and it affects shippers uh, all around the globe, um, including uh, shippers out of Africa that uh, that I think rightly cry cry a little bit foul here, uh, because that it may be the the only region that have seen say deployed capacity fall if we compare year on year uh, deployment uh, by, by, by capacity. So, but if we move on to, uh, to that of, uh, of dry bulk, which I, I guess is close to the hearts of, of you guys in, in Australia, uh, a lot of uh, commodities and predominantly, of course, iron ore is, is being sailed out of uh, Australia to, uh, to, uh, to mainland China. Uh, not so much this year in terms of, of growth rates, uh, but still, I mean, you are second to none in terms of volumes. Uh, but in terms of growth, uh, Brazil beat you guys this year. And that is, of course, something that have uh, impacted uh, the freight rates predominantly for the very large bulk areas and, uh, and the, the cape sizes in general, because Brazilian iron ore exports are up by approximately 10% on last year, whereas uh, the Australian uh, exports are, are up by 0.5, I think, something like that. Uh, but in all uh, uh, meaningful aspects, uh, talking about China and Australia, we can say that without really talking about the, the dispute uh, originating from uh, from uh, well from the COVID uh, and uh, and from a, a shipping perspective. Um, if we focus now narrowly on on that of coal uh, trades, um, it's no uh, secret that uh, that. Uh, well, only a few uh, wheelbarrows of, of coal have, uh, of Australian coal have entered the, uh, uh, the, the Chinese mainland uh, this year. And, uh, and that basically meant that, uh, that the um, coal exporting uh, uh, companies out of Australia have, have well, been in search for, 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 for new homes for, for their export. And they have found that uh, in Japan, in South Korea, and in India. And what did, uh, what did the Chinese do? Well, they went to uh, well, Indonesia, to, to, to South uh, Africa. And uh, in between, well, the global shipping industry benefited because that was uh, an added layer of inefficiency. It's an added layer of, uh, say, longer distances uh, traveling uh, those uh, those uh, volumes. Uh, so, so all a little bit of, of upside also for uh, for the dry bulk shipping sector this year. Actually, it's been quite a recovery and very much staged 
from uh, from uh, again uh, stimulus provided in a very different form from uh, from China. And when China do stimulus, that impacts the dry bulk shipping market. And when the America uh, do uh, do stimulus, it benefits container shipping. And just to 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 wrap up, if I may, that leaves us with uh, with the oil tanker market, uh, mm -hmm. and not only, well, I guess, also the uh, the closures of the refineries in Australia. That of course uh, meant that uh, the tanker shipping is, is more relevant to, uh, to, to you guys than, uh, than ever before. Uh, but of course, uh, what we saw uh, last year uh, in, uh, in March, April and May was the breakdown of the Open Plus Alliance. Uh, that meant that, uh, that the key oil producing nations of the world uh, produced at, at will and basically exported more than, than ever before. And when you do that from a shipping perspective, once you basically see freight rates, of course, go sky high. But you, it also means that future demand is crammed into a much shorter uh, time space. So that have, has, of course, uh, meant that uh, that future demand pushed forward is lacking now. Uh, and overall, from a, from a perspective of global oil demand, it is still uh, lacking uh, on a global scale. Uh, the imports into China, particularly uh, one of the drivers of the crude oil uh, tanker market, uh, is, is, is not strong uh, this year. Uh, so, uh, so it's not uh, particularly surprising that we see uh, contain sorry the crude oil uh, tanker freight rates uh, being uh, lost making right now around ten thousand dollars a day, depending on which ship you are uh, operating and running. Oil product tanker is doing slightly better, but we expect. Uh, uh, a recovery uh, in terms of uh, making freight rates uh, profitable yet again uh, to be some way off. It could be all the way off to uh, to, uh, to to 12 months uh, since um, since the, uh, the winter season uh, is, is only about to uh, to deliver a few spikes with, uh, with uh, overcapacity and most predominantly lack of demand uh, will still hold, hold the industry. So uh, hopefully a small brief on uh, on those three uh, sectors for uh, for your viewers uh, this uh, this day. Uh, Right. Yeah, no, thank you, Peter. That's that's great. And I love the detail that you've given us because it does people focus, as you say, on the container shipping sector, but those other sectors for dry bulk and, and tankers is equally as important. And as you say, more so in, in many industry sectors here for Australia as exporters as well. So thanks for taking the time to really explain that to, to our viewers because again, it's it's often overlooked, but um, you know, again, another reason why we're so uh, grateful to have you on today's show. Peter. With all that said and done, what needs to happen? You know, how do we improve this situation? And, and really, how long do you think it could take to get some sort of turnaround to things start to, to get back to some sort of, uh, I wouldn't say normality, but something close to that? Yeah, well, the term I use uh, quite often these days is, is the next normal, yeah. uh, because going back to, to the pre-pandemic uh, market conditions, uh, it's, it's pointless to talk about that. Uh, but uh, but obviously when uh, when you look at uh, yeah let's 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 just deep dive into to that of the container shipping market uh, that is uh, that is all time high right now obviously what needs to change until we see the next normal arriving where capacity is deployed more evenly where no shippers cry foul where um, where once again we see uh, global supply chains being uh, well, running as smoothly as they as they they used to. Uh, I mean, we're, we're we're quite some way of that uh, from from the seaborne leg of it. I mean, container shipping is really doing whatever they can right now. And I guess the, the best way to, to prove my point here is that we have some 60 to 70 ships now just lying at an anchorage or, or drifting off the coast of US uh, West Coast. Uh, they, they cannot uh, discharge their cargo due to, uh, to uh, all but uh, broken down uh, hinterland connectivity. And it goes all the way from, uh, from an overloaded port. Uh, to, uh, to a lack of chassis and, and basically uh, also um, a lack of truck drivers uh, getting all those uh, those boxes and all those uh, goods, uh, especially into to, to where they are uh, being consumed and then turning around the, the empties, uh, getting them back to, uh, to the main export uh, region of, uh, of, of Asia. Uh, but what needs also to, to, to change for, uh, for, for that of, uh, of the oil tanker market, as alluded to a little bit, uh, we look very much into that of the macroeconomic developments. And, uh, and for the oil tanker market to once again uh, become profitable, 
uh, we need uh, we need oil demand uh, growth. Uh, so we look at, of course, also OPEC Plus Alliance, uh, their uh, tapering of the cuts, uh, which seems to be as uh, if it goes along the current plan uh, to be uh, done uh, one year from now, as they are uh, right now adding 400 thousand barrels per day uh, every month uh, for the coming uh, 12 months approximately. So when we reach September 2022, uh, we, uh, we we should have uh, a normal, say, production level for, for the OPEC Plus Alliance. It's positive, of course, to see that uh, that uh, that more oil is, is getting into the market because uh, tankers need that. Uh, but of course, uh, if we if we take just one deep dive uh, further down, uh, what we what we mostly need is, is not only for for the, uh, the Middle East exporters to to to, to start uh, producing more and exporting more, we still need also the uh, the long hauls uh, out of the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, for instance, to find its way into to South Korea, uh, Japan, and China, because that is really when uh, when the markets are benefiting from uh, from the long sailing distances. Uh, and finally, I mean, in terms of the uh, of the dry bulk shipping industry, our take on it right now is that it's it's, it's very well supported by a lot of uh, temporary uh, support measures, uh, and and the unwinding of those is, is still, in our view, uh, quite some time, uh, some distance away from us. We move into the stronger uh, season of of the year. The second half is always stronger for dry bulk uh, than uh, than the first half. Uh, so, uh, so we are uh, expecting also still support from China, but that support is coming down. I think it's fair to say that uh, that we are seeing weaknesses in in China from uh, from the heavy uh, industrial uh, sectors. Uh, we are also seeing uh, not only the, uh, the the clamp down on on, on Evergrande and, and other uh, say um, uh, developing uh, companies, uh, but 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 that is just uh, what another illustration of the fact that that a lot of dry bulk commodities are also uh, being imported into China, uh, into that of the infrastructure and housing sector. Uh, so obviously some some of those supportive measures are, are easing now. Uh, and we expect also that, uh, that the current uh, level is, uh, is, is a temporary one, uh, but, uh, but it will take uh, easily uh, until uh, the first quarter next year uh, before we really see a significant, uh, say, uh, sliding trend in, in, in freight rates. So a lot of different things need to happen on a global scale. Yeah. As I said, having the world as your playground uh, makes, it, uh, makes it fun every day to, to, to try an hour. I'm sure this, this sort of stuff must be keeping you so busy at the moment, Peter, because so many moving parts and every one little change obviously impacts the other. So uh, it's something that uh, yeah, uh, really, it, 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 you boggle your mind sometimes here from, if you're an importer and exporter, that's my, the, the question I want to sort of end on is, you know, how do importers and exporters get, they can't stay up to date the way you can. You've got this, you know, the ability to really see the bigger picture. They're, they're focused on their business, their imports, their exports, their inventory, the stock. So, you know, what steps would you recommend, Peter, to, for if you were an importer and exporter, how do you navigate this current situation and what can you do to actually try and soften the blow for the impacts now and maybe in the future? The best thing that you can do for, uh, for, for, for yourself is be an expert at what you do best. Uh, make sure that you are absolutely on top of your business and make sure also that you look as far ahead as possible. Uh, because depending on uh, well any uh, shipping sector and and, and uh, the services provided by the maritime industry, uh, they can only benefit you as an exporter as and as an importer in the best possible way when you can show a clear uh, plan for how much you expect to import or export for uh, for the coming uh, uh, weeks, months, quarters, years. Because then you can plan ahead. Then you will not be necessarily at the mercy of the spot market. Uh, you will be able to uh, to um, uh, arrange with your uh, uh, liner company or, or your, uh, say, oil or dry bulk company, uh, either contracts of fragments, uh, long-term uh, agreements uh, with uh, with a fixed volume, a fixed price, uh, for instance. Uh, so making sure that uh, that. Uh, the ships are ready for you when you are ready to to, to, to export or import. Uh, and then, of course, uh, be very much aware of what happens in the global environment, because the more you know also about the global environment, that, that is a, a part of our focus, is, of course, that when you combine that with your uh, own business, 
uh, you just uh, know more about what goes on and you, you bring yourself into a much better uh, negotiation position uh, when, uh, when, when putting out uh, your, your requests uh, and tenders uh, for, for the shipping services. Yeah, wonderful. I couldn't agree more, Peter. Being an, an ex-freight porter myself, I know how challenging and frustrating it is when clients come to you at the last minute when you think, if they only told me a few weeks ago in advance that I could have helped you in so many different options. When the later you make decisions, the less options you have. And the whole purpose of this show and our channel is to really keep people up to date and really show them that there's an easy way to start with that with experts such as yourself from anywhere in the world. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute uh, privilege and a pleasure to have you on Trade Australia today. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, in the evening there over in Copenhagen. So thanks so much. Uh, we generally look forward to hoping you can join us again in the future as all these changes take place over the coming months and potentially you know, even well into 2022 and 23. So I'd love to have you as one of our regulars if you if you would be open to that over the coming months and just to touch base on all these changes. My pleasure, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me today. It was a, it was a great uh, thing for me to do also today. Thanks so much, Peter. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for sharing your industry expertise and insights for all of our viewers here, not just in Australia, but all around the world on Import Export TV. So thanks audience for watching us. I hope you've had a, an amazing opportunity to learn from these three valuable industry experts on how to navigate this global shipping crisis and what the reasons and causes are behind it. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned again next week for another episode of Trade Australia. I'm your host, Lawrence Christophels. Take care, bye.